Thank you so much. Amen. Is this one here? All right. Thank you so much. Great to be here today. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Appreciate that. You can be seated. Thank you. Appreciate that. Great to be in chapel today. This is always the best part. Is this on? Is this on? Are we good? All right. It's always the best part when people just come to Hiles Anderson and the first 30 seconds of chapel, you could just scream random things. It's, it's the best part of chapel. It really is. All the pent up frustration, you could just release it the first 30 seconds. I've heard all kinds of unspeakable things said the first 30 seconds. Yes, is this on? Are we good? All right, I can't hear it, but I guess we're good. Take your Bibles today and turn to 1 Samuel chapter number 28. In your Bible, 1 Samuel chapter number 28. Brother Warren, good to see you. And we went to school together, and great to see you here in chapel. All of you visitors and delegates, Thank you for being here. I hope you enjoy our wonderful Northwest Indiana weather. It'll snow this morning. It'll be 90 degrees tonight and a possible tornado tomorrow. And uh, all for the cause, preparing soldiers for Jesus Christ. <laughs> you come here and you can leave this place, go anywhere and serve God, all right? But uh, anyhow, 1 Samuel chapter number 28 in your Bible I uh, prayed about the message, and the Lord has directed my heart to a familiar passage for me, but a message I don't think I've ever preached here in Hiles Anderson Chapel, and uh, one that I want to bring uh, today. And I'm asking God to give to everybody in this room, just, just for 30 minutes or so, a sense of urgency. I'm asking God to somehow help the things that happen here to carry over into the rest of the day and for the rest of our lives, and to give us in these last days in which we live a sense of urgency. We live in, in such a day of apprehension. People afraid to, to take that step forward. It's like we're glued to our seats and our hearts are fixed on that which is familiar and safe. Richard Baxter said, I preach as never sure to preach again as a dying man to dying men. And that's how I want to preach to you this morning. And that's how I want to live my life, is never sure to preach again, never sure to witness again as a dying man to dying men. And God give us a sense of urgency today. I believe that our time is short you say, Brother Judah, do you believe Jesus is coming back? I do, absolutely. Do you believe it's soon? Sooner today than it was yesterday. I don't know how soon, but I know that we should be listening for the trumpet. And if you're paying attention to world events, I believe that God has given us a space of time. Not to make money, not to live comfortably, but to make a difference for Jesus Christ. But we need to have a sense of urgency in our hearts. Something that I feel we're desperately lacking and that we certainly need. Saul was the king of Israel. He was at this point near the end of his reign. Frankly, he was in his final moments. He started off well. He began right, as so many of us begin right, but his ending was tragic. I would hate to think that in this room there would be tragic endings. But Saul, at this point in his life, is isolated. Sin has totally deceived and disillusioned him. It has, it has warped his thinking, as sin always will. He trusts nobody. His advisor, the, the prophet Samuel, is dead. He's in heaven. He's gone. And now Saul is in a position where his back is against the wall. The Philistines are upon him. He's getting ready to make war. He uh, can't really make a decision. And so in desperation, he does the unthinkable. 
He finds himself, and you can read the story. It's, in my opinion, the creepiest passage in the Bible. The Bible says that King Saul disguises himself, puts on other raiment, takes a few men with him, and he finds, somewhere in the kingdom, he finds a literal witch. Somebody practicing witchcraft. These types of people had been banished from the kingdom. They were uh, no longer in operation. It was one of the first things that Saul did when he was a new king and his heart was humble and right before God. But now he's looking for a witch to give him advice. And he finds one. The witches of the day were operating underground under the threat of death. And yet he found one, the witch of Endor. And he goes to her because he wants to see if she could bring Samuel back from the dead. Again, it's a much disputed passage in the Bible, but it is a very clear passage in 1 Samuel 28. We don't have time to read it all. Could you imagine the depths that Saul had sunk to? To find a witch, to try to just get a word from God. God had stopped speaking to him. God had long ago stopped moving in his heart. And now he's looking to bring somebody back from the dead to get some advice. Young people, sin will take you further than you want to go. It'll keep you longer than you want to stay. It'll cost you more than you're willing to pay. If you ever say to yourself, I would never do, you better watch yourself. Sin will take you to that very spot. So there he is in the dark of night. Knocks on her door. She answers. The Bible says in verse number 8 of 1 Samuel 28, Saul disguised himself, put on other raiment, and he went, two men with him. And they came to the woman by night, and he said, I pray thee, divine unto me by the familiar spirit, and bring me him up, whom I shall name unto thee. And the woman said unto him, Behold, thou knowest what Saul hath done, how he hath cut off those that have familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. Wherefore then layest thou a snare for my life to cause me to die? She says, I, I can't do that. You've got the wrong person. All of those kinds of people have been cut off from the land. And why would you ask something of that like that from me? Are you, are you trying to trap me? Saul swear to her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord liveth, there shall no punishment happen to thee for this thing. Saul looks right at her and he says, listen, I can only imagine the desperation in his voice, the fear in his eyes. As he says, listen, nothing will happen to you. You better be careful, teenager, young person. When somebody looks at you and says, just do it, just do it. Nothing will happen. No one will ever know. It's just us here. Those are dangerous words. Nothing will happen. And I could imagine the fakeness that she had put on when she answered the door disappeared and melted away. There's an evil look in her eyes if she says in verse number 11, then said the woman, whom shall I bring up unto thee? I can do it. You're at the right place. Who do you want to come back? Saul answers her in verse number 11. He said, bring me up, Samuel. That preacher that I should have listened to when he was alive. That preacher that I ignored. That preacher who I thought was just b b preaching against me. The, the one that I would give anything to hear his voice and his wisdom and his counsel one more time. Bring him back from the dead. Oh, young person, you better be careful when you drift from God. You better be careful when God stops speaking. You better be careful when sermons just roll off the, the, the back and in one ear and out the other. The time may come when you'll do anything to sit in the chapel service again. You would do anything to hear the voice of God. He says, I just want to hear from Samuel one last time. And it happens. You can read the chapter. Samuel appears, and the conversation that they have is the point of the message. Look at what Samuel says in verse number 16. Then said Samuel, wherefore then dost thou ask of me, seeing the Lord is departed from thee, 
and is become thine enemy. And the Lord hath done to him as he spake by me. For the Lord hath rent the kingdom out of thine hand and given it to thy neighbor, even to David. Because thou obeyest not the voice of the Lord, nor executest his fierce wrath upon Amalek. Therefore hath the Lord done this thing unto thee this day. And here it is in verse number 19. Saul in the house of a witch. Saul being visited by a preacher from the dead. Unbelievable. And the preacher says to him in verse number 19. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with thee into the hand of the Philistines. And look at it. And tomorrow shalt thou and thy sons be with me. And tomorrow. Hey, Saul, you came to ask me some advice about a war. That doesn't matter now, Saul. Your plan coming into this thing doesn't matter right now, Saul, because I've got news for you from God. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Not next month, not next year, not 10 years from now, not sometime in the distant future, uh, not in old age, Saul, but tomorrow you're going to be with me. God, give us a sense of urgency as we examine our lives in the small time that we have on this earth, not to waste time and not to, not to live for ourselves, but to realize that, that tomorrow is coming faster than anybody in this room would care to admit. Tomorrow, Saul, you'll be with me. Saul was given 24 hours to live. 24 hours, to, it's right there. You say, Brother Judah, did it happen? You read 1 Samuel chapter 31, and you will see that the very next day, Saul and his sons are in eternity. Here's the message. What would you do if you knew that you had 24 hours to live? What would you do if the message was so certain, if you absolutely knew that this was your last day, your last moment, your last chance, your last opportunity, your last phone call, the last time you'd look into the face of a loved one? What would you do, young person? What would you do, Hiles Anderson, if you knew, if you knew that you had 24 hours to live? What would you say? What decisions would you make? How clean would your heart be? If you knew that there was only a day left, I've examined my life. I've looked at the story of Saul, and I am amazed at what he did and what he didn't do. And I want to ask you, what would you do if you knew that you only had a day to go? Father in heaven, I pray that you'd bless the message, the short time that we've set aside for preaching. Lord, would you somehow use my words to speak to the hearts of every person in this room? God, this is the thought that has motivated me throughout the years. Lord, we don't have all the time in the world to do the work of God. And so help us to live for today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. What would you do if you knew you only had 24 hours to live? Early on in my Christian experience, something very significant happened to me as a young Christian. There was a man in my life named Jason. He was my half-sister's half-brother. No blood relation to me, but, but uh, he was just more of a family friend, but he was my half-sister's half-brother. And several years older than me, Jason was a wild child. Jason was in and out of juvenile hall. He was in and out of uh, drug rehab. He was, he was just a wild, rebellious type. Jason would uh, show up, and I, I was that little brother, you know, and I loved messing with him. How many of you have a little brother who's very annoying? Raise your hand. Yes. I, have a, I, I was kind of like that little kid hanging around, and, and I loved messing with him. This is before the day of cell phones, and, and uh, uh, caller ID had just come out. I know. I, I should stop right now. But uh, caller ID had just come out. Caller ID was a little box. Remember, remember that little box that you put? It used to be, man, it used to be like the Wild West answering your phone. You never knew who, who was on the other line. The phone would ring, hello, and you'd hear the person, ah, oh, you know. And if you didn't want to talk to him, you'd have to fake static. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't hear it. Click. And uh, now, you know, it's easy. You can just, uh, nope. <laughs> and, uh, but back in the day, it wasn't that way until caller ID came out. Caller ID came out, and the person's name would pop up there, and then you could, you could decide, you know, if you're going to answer the phone or not. I can remember caller ID came out and Jason's number would, would pop on the phone. He would always be looking for my sister. And, and man, I, I, uh, I loved it. Just as a little, I was just maybe 10 years old. 
But when his name would pop up, I would just get excited. I would pick up the phone and I would pretend to be, I don't know why, and this is, this is, this is terrible. Of all the people I could have uh, uh, pretended to be, I would pretend to be a, a uh, Kmart worker. I would pick up the phone. I'd say, Kmart, this is Julie speaking. And uh, yeah, I don't know why. I need to change that part of the message, but I'm just trying to be honest. And uh, Kmart, this is you. And Jason would say, oh, oh, I'm sorry, I got the wrong number. He'd hang up, and I would just laugh. I'd laugh, knowing that he'd be calling back. And, and sure enough, he'd call back. I'd pick it up, and I'd, Kmart, this is Pam. And uh, he'd say, is this 708? I'd say, yeah, it is. Loser. Click. And, uh, and then, and then he'd, he'd call back again, and he would just, you know, it would not be good. And uh, the things I heard. And... Uh, Anyways, that was just, listen, that was our relationship. It was just, just, I, I loved messing with them. Jason moved away. Years went by. He moved to Florida and years went by and, and I lost track of him. Got saved in that time. Got called to preach in that time. Went to Bible college. I was a freshman here at Hiles Anderson. I was coming home from church on a Sunday night. I lived maybe 45 minutes away in Blue Island, Illinois. And I was coming home from church. And I remember having my shirt and tie on and walking into the house, into the living room of the house with my Bible. And when I walked in, the whole family was there. Everybody, my mom, my sisters, my brothers, a couple of family friends. And sitting on the couch was Jason. I hadn't seen him in years. He was right there and he looked at me and he said, huh? It's true. And I said, what? He said, a preacher, it's true. And I said, it is true, Jason. You see, the family had arranged, Jason was in town and the family had arranged for Jason to be there because they wanted me to save Jason. If you come from, if you're a first generation Christian, you understand what I'm talking about. They didn't realize Jesus does the saving. They thought that I could come and, and save Jason. And so there I was with my Bible and he said, it's true. And I said, it is. And he said, I don't believe it. And he threw out some curse words and had some harsh language. And, and I said, Jason, let me show you what the Bible says. Let me show you what happened to me, Jason. Let me take a minute and just show you how Jesus changed my life. He got offended at that. He stood up. He said, I don't want to hear any of that. He said, you're crazy. And I can remember as he walked over to the, to the wall there in the living room where we had a light switch. And he said, Abdel, let me tell you something. He said, there is no God. There is no heaven. There is no hell. He said, We're, our body is just made up of electrical impulses. And, and when we die, he hit the light switch. And he said, it's just like that. He turned the lights back on. I said, Jason, don't say that. I said, Jason, that is not true. I said, Jason, you're believing a lie. I said, there is a God and there is a Savior and there is a heaven and there is a hell and there is an eternity. Jason, just give me a minute, Jason. Just give me one second. We haven't seen each other in forever. Just give me one second. He walked by me. He laughed. He cussed. He walked out the door and he said, hey, preacher, I'm going. And he named a place where no Christian should ever be. Why don't you come with me? You'll like it there. So Jason, you know I'm not going to go there. You know I wouldn't go there. That's what I thought. He laughed and he shut the door at 12641 Artesian Avenue. A couple of days later, my sister went missing. It was never good when Jason and my sister were together. Rebellious, drugs, lifestyle. My sister went missing, we went looking for her, and the rest of the story is told by my brother, who came to me after finding something unbelievable. He went to my sister's apartment to look for her. He knocked on the door. Nobody answered the door. He was going to leave, but he heard noise in the apartment. He opened up the door, and, and when he opened up the door, it was, it was open, and, and, they, and he went in, and he started looking around, and he said, Abdel, there's just all this noise, and so I, I realized it was the TV was on, so I went to go turn off the TV. He said, and when I turned the corner to turn off the TV, there he was on the couch. My brother telling me this after the fact. He came to me, he said, I'm having nightmares, man. He said, I don't know who to talk to. I, I don't know what to do. I've got to tell you this. And he said, uh, Jason was on the couch. He said he had a needle hanging out of his arms. He said, I went to go real quick, call the, call the, uh, the, the, the ambulance and 911. He said, and when I grabbed the phone, this is what he said. This is his story. He said, Jason, shot up. He looked right at me, he said, Abdel, he looked right through me. And he said, in hell. And he dropped. He passed away that day. Young people, 
I often wonder what Jason would have done just a few days prior there at 12641 Artesian Avenue as he strutted over to that light switch thinking he had all the time in the world. I wonder if he would have rejected the gospel. I wonder if he would have laughed at God. I wonder if he would have said our body is just made up of electrical impulses and there is no eternity and there is no heaven and there is no hell. I wonder if he would have just callously shut the switch and walked away. Hey, I often, what if he would have known that he only had a couple of days left? What if he would have known that far sooner than he imagined he'd be standing on the very brink of eternity? What if he would have known that this was his last chance and his last opportunity what would he have done what would you do if you knew that this was the last message you'd ever hear if you knew that this was the last time you'd ever sit next to that friend the last phone conversation you'd ever make my friends I'm just here today to say if you would do it in your last day we ought to do it today boast not of tomorrow thou knowest not what a day may bring forth what is your life it's but a vapor that appears for a short time and then vanishes away the Bible says what would you do I've examined my life, and in a few moments, I'm going to tell you what I would do if I knew that this was my last day on earth. Number one, I would do this. Number one, I would encourage you to do the same. Number one, I would examine my salvation. I would examine my salvation. You know, the unbelievable thing about King Saul, he is told, you have a day left. We see no movement towards God, not a prayer, not a thought, nothing. There's nothing there. For all we know, he sat at the bed of a witch and was fed by her hand in his final moment. Young person, if I knew this was my last day, I would examine my salvation. Man, I know that I'm saved. There's no doubt in my mind right now. I can take you to a time. I can take you to a place. I can take you to a moment, my friend. If salvation is not a process, it's a moment. I can remember when I was born again by the grace of God. But you better believe if somebody came back from the dead and said, Abdel, this is the last message you'll ever preach, I would revisit that in my mind. I would. What about you? Hey, when you think about your, you say, Brother Judy, you know where we're at? We're at Howes Anderson College. This is college days. This is the best of the best. I know exactly where we are. Just a few days ago, I was at our high school with the best of the best, in my opinion. Young people have been raised in church and born and raised with the Bible. And I watched as teenager after teenager after teenager got the assurance of their salvation. I listened to a senior in our high school say, I was 99% sure but every time hell was preached every time God moved that one percent kept, kept popping up in my mind and finally as a senior he humbled himself and he said I just need to get it settled if Pastor Wilkerson were here today he'd say the biggest mistake a man can make is going to hell over a mistake and that mistake is to just sit there and to convince yourself I, I think I'm saved I, I, they told me I was saved and I'm living a good life and, and just to, listen what would you do if you knew this was it what would you do? Man, I watched 12 young people, 13 young people last week, or last, uh, last summer camp in August. My own son, my own son came to me on a Tuesday night. He said, Dad, I need to be saved. And man, he was saved right then and there. If you're in this room, I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just trying to have you revisit and examine yourself. Do you know that you're saved? Hey, if you're born again, the Bible says the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. God. God is telling you right now you're saved. God is taking you back to that time and place. He's giving you the assurance. But what if he's not? What would you do if you knew this was your final day? I would examine my salvation. Salvation is personal. Nobody's saved because they're in a crowd, because of their family name. Nobody is saved because they're in a Bible college. Salvation is simple, but it's certain. Salvation is not difficult, but it is definite. And you better know that you're born again. What would you do if you knew that this was your last day? Number one, I would examine my salvation. Number two, this is just me. This is me. I, I, I would find my family. And I would tell them how much I loved them. That's what I would do. And let me just stop and say... You're not right with God if you're wrong with mom and dad. And I want to ask you, hey, college student, you're here at Hiles Anderson. You're doing the best that you can. How are things back home? 
How are things with mom and dad, brothers and sisters? How, how are things? Man, if, you, if it were your last day, I promise you, you would find mom and dad. I promise, I've got, I've got a wife that I love with all of my heart. I've got three children. And man, if this were my last day, I would find them. They would know. Remember my son, Derek, I'm sorry, Adam. Adam was just a little guy. It was his first week in church and, and uh, coming up from the nursery and we're having a week-long revival. Ranger Walker was there, Kevin Walker, doing his puppets, doing his stuff. He was there and he'd always pick on somebody in the crowd and this is Adam. If you know my son Adam, man, who knows what's going to come out of his mouth. He's going to say whatever, whatever is there is coming out of his mouth. And yes, that's gotten me in trouble before. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Anyways, but... um. <laughs> First week in church, big church. Ranger Walker had his puppet Gabby out. He's telling everybody whatever. And he says, hey, crowd, guess who I saw the other day? Everybody said, who? He said, I saw Brother Judah. Oh, guess what he was doing? What? This is what Ranger Walker said. He was smoking a cigarette. And when he said that, my son looked at me. I mean, just like shattered, you know, hero status gone. And I looked at him and said, no, no, no. Yeah. So he went on with this little routine. Oh, brother Judah, brother Judah. I guess where else I saw him? Where? He was going into a bar. He was drinking a beer. And my son just crying now. <laughs> I said, no, no. And Ranger Walker finally just said, ah, Brother Judah's just like the devil. And man, my son, four years old, five years old, whatever it was, he had enough. He stood up on the pew. He said, hey, my dad's not the devil. He's just like Jesus. And when he said that, I thought, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. If it were my last day, I'd find him. I'd find him. I've got a dad that's not saved, and if it were my last day, I'd find him. You see, God, give us a sense of urgency. God, help us to get over our apprehension and fear and to step out and to, and to do something for God and to, and to act, to act, to act, to not wait. What would you do if it were your last day? I would find my family and tell them how much I loved them. Next, if it were my last day, I would want nothing between my soul and the Savior. Hey, my friend, if I knew that I would be meeting Jesus soon, I would want nothing between my soul and the Savior. I mean, if this were my last moment, I would want it to be clean. My friend, nothing secret, nothing hidden, nothing, nothing that I'm nervous about will come out someday if, if this were it. Nothing between my soul and the Savior. Nothing I'm hiding. Nothing I'm justifying in my mind. Nothing that's there when nobody else sees. Oh, friend, here's the thing with Saul. We know some things about Saul. He hated David. He lived with bitterness, anger, jealousy, and he never addresses it. He went into eternity that way. He never exercised the forgiveness that he should have. He never, he never got himself right with God. He, he went into eternity with all of his sin and all of his baggage. There are people in this room right now, weighed down, guilt, shame, anger, jealousies, bitterness, lust. And, and if this were it, man, if this were it, you would meet Jesus with all of that. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, the Bible says. It's been a long time since we confessed our sins and repentance towards God. It's been a long time since we hid an altar, confessed and forsook and left it there. If this were your last day, you better believe you would want to do it. What would I do if this were my final day? Quickly. I would examine my own salvation, and I encourage you to do that. If this were my final day, I would make sure that I was right, Brother John, with those that I love the most, my family. Some of you ought to make some phone calls. You ought to make some phone calls. 
Boy, you, let me tell you something. I preach camps every week of the summer. And let me tell you, when I know as a preacher that it's getting real at teen camp, when the phone starts ringing back home, when the teens can't even wait to get on the bus and they're calling mom and dad and I'm sorry and I love you and, and I'll explain later, and that's when you know it's getting real. And there's some of you, hey man, I'm not, look, I'm not here to beat you up. There's some of you, you're a freshman in college, you took off, you're 17, 18 years old, and it's almost like mom and dad's opinion doesn't even matter anymore. You're crazy. You're crazy. You got a mom and dad sitting at home praying for you, worried about you. You ought to get right with family. I would want nothing between my soul and the Savior. I mean, nothing there. All the things that we justify, the questionable gray area, whatever. You wouldn't want to meet Jesus with it. You know it. Saul did. You wouldn't want to. Finally, I would want my last day to give glory to God. I'm talking about my final day. I would want it to give glory to God. Let me tell you what's so despicable about Saul's final day. He was a king, a king. He should have been laid in state. He should have been given a royal funeral and the whole country should have come and paid the respects. But that's not what happened. His head was severed. His body was nailed to a goddess's wall. And rejoice with the enemies of God laughing and dancing all around it. Just another trophy in the devil's showcase. Another person who knew better but didn't do better. Shameful is what it was. Shameful. I would want my last day to give glory to God. My sister's in eternity. Died of a heroin overdose. I have time to tell the story. Her last Facebook post was, I need to defeat this demon. She went to one more party. She sat on one more couch. Took one more hit. In her last day, a good person, a good person. But it didn't bring glory to her God. I'm often reminded of the story. It's one of my favorite stories to tell. It's a story of the song behind I have decided to follow Jesus. And if you've heard it, just bear with me. It motivates me every time I read it, every time I hear it. We sing the song, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. It's a great song. We sing it at camps and teen meetings especially, and the world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back, no turning back. Though no one join me, still I will follow, no turning back, no turning. We sing the song. If you were to Google where the song came from, you'd find this story, you'd find it rather quickly. Many people think that the song came from a soloist from yesterday named George Beverly Shea, who would travel with Billy Graham. He really popularized the song in America, but he did not write the song, nor did he give the tune. He just popularized it. The, story, the song comes from the early 1900s, a true story, a missionary who labored most of his life in northern India, a very hardened, dangerous place for the gospel, a place where people weren't looking to go. <laughs> they were looking to leave. Tribal, brutal people. Missionary went there and he labored a lifetime. Never had a single convert till his final moments in ministry. One man and his wife and two children got saved. You can look the story up. Google it. They got saved while the missionary was leaving. He had labored, he had preached the gospel, but the tribal chief was so hard he wouldn't allow anybody to listen except for this one family decided we're going to believe this and they got saved. The chief waited for the missionary to leave and then he called the new convert and his family to the center square of the village. Looked at him and he said, do you know why I've called you here today? The new convert said, yes, I do. I am here today because I've decided to follow Jesus. The chief said, that's right. We're not going to have any of that in our village. That missionary came and nobody ever listened to him. We're not going to start listening to him now. I'm going to give you one chance to take it back. One chance to recant or else I'm going to kill you. And I'm going to kill your wife. And I'm going to kill your children right here, right now. Why are you here? With all the courage and faith and boldness of a new convert. The man looked at the chief and he said, I am here because I have decided to follow Jesus.
When the words came out of his mouth, the chief had archers staged throughout the village, hidden, but they pulled back their arrows, their bows. They released their arrows, and the arrows flew through the day, and just, whoosh, just you could hear them fly, and they filled his wife like a, like a pincushion. She dropped to the floor, dead. The chief said, why are you here? And the story is, the new convert looked at his wife, took a step past her and said, the world behind me, the cross before me, I have decided to follow Jesus. The arrows pulled back, flew through the day air, filled his children both with arrows and just like a needle in a pincushion, they dropped. Why are you here? He took a step past. He said, though no one joined me, Still, I will follow. And as he lifted his hands to the heaven, he said, I have decided to follow Jesus. Arrows on their way, flying through the air. I have decided to follow Jesus. And now, now there will be no turning back, no turning back. And he was filled and fell. And that's the end of the story, but it's not the end of the story. Word of that got out in India somehow. Providence of God. They got to an evangelist's ears, an Indian evangelist called the, the, the prophet with bloody feet, he was called. He would go from village to village preaching the gospel. He decided to see if the story was true, and he went to this northern village in Assam, called Assam, northern village in India, expecting to find tribal people, hardened people. When he walked in, he was stunned. He saw a church, a cross. And he saw Christians, even the village chief, everybody after that man gave glory to God in his last day. Everybody was converted. The gospel seed had been sown there a long time. They knew what was right. It just took one man to give glory to God. True story. I don't know how that Indian man lived his whole life. I don't know what he did every day, but I know what he did on his last day. He gave glory to his God with his life, with his lips, frankly, with everything that he had. He gave glory to God. He didn't try to calculate a way, a way out, try to, try to find a compromise. Try to, he just said, I've decided to follow Jesus. And now there'll be no turning back. No turning back. We sing the song, and I can only imagine camp after camp as young person after young person are making decisions peering over the banisters of heaven. There's an Indian man and his wife and children. And it's real to them today, my friend. Saul, tomorrow, tomorrow, you'll be with me. I'm thinking of scriptures right now. Look on the fields, for they are white, all ready to harvest, all ready I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. Awake to righteousness and sin not. Some have not the knowledge of God among you. And I speak this to your shame. We need to live for Jesus. We need to witness. We need to give glory to God. We need to be clean. We need to live with reckless abandonment, realizing that our time is short. It's short. We sit in our seats, apprehensive, nervous, scared, fearful, wasting our lives. I wouldn't do that on my last day. Would you bow your heads, please, and close your eyes? What would you do if you knew that you only had 24 hours to live? What would you do? Everybody standing, please. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I wonder, people are already moving and that is fine, but I wonder if there anybody here at College Days, anyone here at Hiles Anderson that would say, Brother Jude, I'm thinking about my own salvation right now. I've put it off. I have 1% doubt. I'm not certain. I didn't come here for this. I came here to look at a college and to, and to, and to play and to have fun. And, and I'm, I'm thinking about a championship game. I didn't come here for this, Brother Judah. Yes, but God is here for this moment. 
Who would say, Brother Judah, I need to get my salvation settled. Pray for me. Pray for me that I not put it off another moment. I need to get my salvation settled. Would you raise your hand and let me see? Anybody at all like that? I need to get my salvation settled. Is there anybody like that in the crowd? I need to get my salvation settled. Who would say, Brother Judah, there's sin in my life. There are things there, man, if I had to meet Jesus. There's things there that I would want to confess and forsake and get rid of. Pray for me, Brother Judah. I need to do some business with God. Would you slip your hand up and let me see? There's things there. I see those hands. Things there. Who would say, Brother Judah, I need to get right with some people back home. People back home. Mom, dad, brothers, sisters, cousins, whatever. Who would simply say, I just want my last day to give glory to God. Friend, the altar is open. You come. Others have come. Let's do business with our great God. 24 hours to live. What would you do? Think about this crazy world that we've lived in, this COVID, this wars and rumors of wars. We need to be right with God. Let me tell you the devil's favorite word, tomorrow. It's his favorite word, tomorrow. Do it tomorrow. Give your life tomorrow. Get your salvation settled tomorrow. Witness to that person at work, do it, but do it tomorrow. Friends, at some point, we need to grab hold of today. Today. Live for Jesus. Knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. What would you do if you knew? You only had 24 hours to live.